Amen. Hello, everybody. That was a great time of worship. Let's pray together. Father, we now want to hear from you as we open your word. We ask you to speak to us from it as we learn more about what it really means to have Christ in our heart, as Paul brings some real clarity to that topic. So we commit this time of Bible study to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Pastor Mike mentioned that I'm gonna be uh, in the God Came Near series this coming Sunday, and my topic is Lost in Translation. You'll have to come and find out what that means. Um, how many of you heard the uh, speech from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to the Congress? That was, uh, that was pretty impressive. I love the way that he started with a story from the Bible, the story of Esther. And how that wicked plot was hatched by Haman. By the way, that was the ancient Persian Empire. A uh, plot was hatched by Haman to eradicate the Jewish people. But God raised up the courageous Hadassah, Esther, uh, to stand up for what is true. And the whole plot was foiled. Haman ended up hanging on the gallows he had erected for another. But the point was, it was a plot to destroy the Jewish people. What a perfect place to start because here we are, so many years later, and here we are with Iran with a plot to destroy the Jewish people. They, they've come out and they've said it as plain as day. We want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Even the so-called moderate leader of Iran has recently said that, yet uh, we're in this kind of negotiation with them right now. And uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu made an interesting statement. Uh, I'll quote from his speech for a moment. He says, quote, the difference is, he's talking about ISIS now, uh, he says, ISIS is armed with butcher knives, uh, butcher knives, captured weapons, and YouTube, whereas Iran could soon be armed with intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear bombs. We must always remember, I'll say it one more time, the greatest danger facing our world is the marriage of militant Islam with nuclear weapons. To defeat ISIS and let Iran get nuclear weapons would be to win the battle and lose the war. We cannot let that happen. There's a lot of applause for that, and that's very true. And you know, it's interesting because there are many nations in the end time scenario we can guess at as players. Magog most certainly is Russia. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, we know that Persia in Ezekiel is Iran and Iran is Persia. And we know this, Iran's gonna march on Israel. Iran is going to attack Israel along with Magog. So that's very interesting when you look at what's happening in our world in the light of Bible prophecy. And I think we need to really be praying for our president. And we need to be praying for our military. And we need to be praying for the nation Israel and pray for the peace of Jerusalem as scripture commands us. And here's something that I posted and some people got upset about it. So I'll say it again because <laughs> I love to just get people upset. Um, I said in some ways America needs Israel more than Israel needs America. And let me explain the statement. Let me explain the statement. Uh, we've been a great friend to Israel and her ally since she began as a nation on May 14th, 1948. But that has uh, benefited us as well as it has benefited her because God says in Genesis, speaking to Abraham, I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. I believe one of the reasons God has blessed our country is because we have blessed Israel. We have blessed the Jewish homeland. We have stood by her. And if we stand back from her, well, we won't have that blessing as we once had it. At the end of his speech, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu made a statement that, that Israel, if necessary, will stand alone. But then he said, but America stands with us. And there's a lot of applause. But you know, the truth is, one day, uh, they are gonna stand alone. Because according to the scenario in Ezekiel, they're attacked by Magog and her allies, which include Iran, and there isn't gonna be any superpower to save her. But the greatest superpower in heaven will save her. The Lord God will intervene. So, interesting times, folks. I'll tell you what, that this is important stuff, and uh, we wanna just be in prayer about it. And now we're gonna open up our Bibles to the book of Ephesians and we're in chapter three. And we're gonna go through all of chapter three in our one message here. The title of my message is, Is Christ at Home in Your Heart? 
Now we've all heard the expression that you just need to receive Jesus Christ into your life or sometimes as it said, you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Is that really biblical to say such a thing? Heard the story of a mother who was telling her little daughter that Jesus lived in her heart and so the little girl put her ear to her mom's chest and the mom said, what are you doing? She said, I'm listening for Jesus. The mom said, what is he saying right now? And the little girl listened a little bit more and said, right now I think he's making coffee. So I don't know if that mom had indigestion or what. But let me say this. It is biblical to say you should receive Christ into your life. It is biblical to say you should ask Jesus Christ to come in your heart. Why? Because Colossians 1.27 says, this is a secret, Christ lives in you. And then we're told in John 1.12, for as many as received him, he gave him the right to become a child of God. Jesus said in John 14, 23, if any man loves me and he'll keep my word, my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So indeed Christ does come to live inside us and indeed we do receive him and God does make his home with us. But the most oft quoted verse when it comes to this topic is certainly Revelation 3.20 where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him or dine with him and he with me. And really it's interesting because contextually that statement was given to the church of Laodicea which is also known as the lukewarm church. I think you could make a pretty good case for questioning if many of the people in this church were even believers. But to sort of the compromised person, to the lukewarm person, the person who is not as committed as they ought to be, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock, and if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. You know, when we talk about Jesus dining with us, the meaning of that is lost in our fast food culture. You know, because we go to the fast food place and we order our food, and now they have a little timer, you know, that so, you know that you can watch if your food's being made quickly enough. And uh, now, in and out, they take longer, um, but it's worth the wait, isn't it? Come on, yeah. So, but you know, it's fast food it's still, and so you eat it on the run and so forth. And and so this idea of dining is sort of lost in us in many ways in the 21st century. You know, in the first century, in the days of Jesus, they didn't have drive-through restaurants. They didn't have like McDavid's or something, you know, <laughs> Falafel Bell, I don't know what, uh, in and out something, but um, bagel, there you go. Um, no, but you know, they, they would, the meal was the main event of the day. There were no televisions, there were no video games or tablet devices or iPhones. You no, know, you would just, at the end of the day, kick back, you would relax and have a long leisurely meal with your close friends and your family. It was a time to let your hair down. In my case, that's singular. But um, the idea was to enjoy fellowship one with another. So when Jesus says, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come and dine with you, or King James, sup with you, that's the idea, we'll spend time together. Have you ever had someone say, hey, you know, I wanna, I wanna go to dinner with you? You know, and you don't know them that well, you're kind of reluctant, right? Because it's like, hey, dinner's long, you know? Uh, and I'm gonna be with you, I don't know if I wanna have dinner with you, and especially if it's someone who's trying to sell something. I have people come to me fairly regularly and they have a pitch they want to make and could I just take you to dinner? And I'll usually say, kind of busy, no, sorry. Because I know as long as they're paying for the meal, I'm sort of stuck there with them and so I really don't want to do that. I'd rather just have a meeting with them and, you know, get it over with. Um, how about lunch? Uh, you know, not so much. Uh, and I'll say maybe a cup of coffee. You know, because you can drink coffee this fast. It's over with, you know? Now why do I say that? Because I don't want to have dinner or lunch with someone who gives me indigestion. I save those meals for my family and my friends and people that I basically want to hang out with. So some of you are thinking, yeah, but I just asked you to dinner and you said no. Where does that put me? You know exactly where it puts you, okay? <laughs> And by the way, I'd only disappoint you. 
You know, some people will say, oh, I, I would like to you know, get to know my pastor and, and have Greg over for dinner. You know, you really wouldn't. I'd let you down in so many ways. It's better if you just know me at a distance, okay? But um, so here's the idea. When you're a friend with someone, you'll get a meal together. In fact, you know, when someone comes over to your house and, and you don't know them very well, uh, they'll say, can I come in? And if you decide to let them into your house, you maybe bring them into your living room. That's pretty much the most worthless room ever created. Does anyone even use a living room? Come into my living room. You know, and maybe you'll bring them into your family room, but if they're a friend, your friend or a family member, they're coming where? Into your kitchen. What is it with kitchens? I notice it's true, no matter how big or beautiful the home, everybody ends up in the kitchen leaning up against the stove, you know, their shirts are on fire, but there's something about the kitchen. Why, because that's where the food is getting prepared. That's where the action is. And so when you're really close to someone, then you'll come right in, you'll go and you'll be in their kitchen, maybe you'll raid their fridge. Uh, if you're close to someone, you're sitting with them at a meal, if they see something on your plate that looks good, they'll just dive in and start taking it, right? By the way, men, we don't really like that. Okay, just girls so you know. Your girls are all in the, let's share, let's divide everything, share, share. And then share what we share what we share. Okay, guys, we're more like, think of a dog with a bowl. Okay, food, you know when you touch a dog when he's eating, he growls, that's a man eating. Okay, just let us have our meal. Here's the thing, we'll buy you your own meal. Happily, don't take our food from us. But anyway. So that's the picture, Jesus wants to dine with us. So here's my question. Do you think Jesus is comfortable hanging out with you? Are you the kind of a person that he can have a long, leisurely meal with? Hey, he, could he actually take some food off your plate if he wanted to? Uh, is that the kind of relationship you have, or is it more formal or a bit removed? We're gonna get to that in a moment. But before we do, let's reflect, reflect briefly on what we've seen here in the book of Ephesians. As you recall, uh, this book is divided into three sections. The wealth, the walk, and the warfare of the believer. First, there's the wealth. Chapters one to three, that's the section we're in now. This is our last look at the so-called wealth section of Ephesians, and when we talk about wealth, we're talking about the spiritual riches that God has given to every one of his followers. Then there is the walk section, that's chapter four uh, to chapter six, and we're gonna get to that next. And finally, there's the warfare section, and that's why I've called this series Live, Love, and Fight. And so now we're gonna just have one final reflection on what we've learned in the first part of Ephesians. Paul effectively goes over some of his older material, if you will. So let's read Ephesians chapter three, uh, verses one to seven. And for this particular portion, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Paul writes, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Because of my preaching to you Gentiles, as you already know, God has given me this special ministry of announcing his favor to the Gentiles. As I mentioned before earlier in this letter, God himself revealed his secret plan to me. As you read what I've written, you will understand what I know about this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it in previous generations, but now he has revealed it to us by the Holy Spirit and to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is a secret plan. The Gentiles have an equal share with the Jews and all the riches inherited by God's children. Both groups have believed the good news and both are part of the same body and enjoy the promise of blessings through Christ Jesus. By God's special favor and mighty power, I've been given the wonderful privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Verse one, Paul uses this phrase, for this reason. For this reason, Paul's drawing on what has already been said. There's repetition in the Bible. You've probably noticed there's repetition in my sermons. You say, well, I've heard that before. I know, that's intentional. But I've heard your jokes before. I know, I only have three. Okay, but 
The thing is, there is a need for repetition. Why? Because we often forget what we ought to remember and we remember what we ought to forget. You know, you rack your brain, you see somebody, what's her name, what's her name, what's her name? You can't remember it, but you still know all the lyrics to the lamest song ever written 30 years ago. Why? Why do I retain worthless data in my brain and why is it I can't recall data I need in the moment? Well, I need to reinforce what I've learned over and over again. Uh, Peter said the same thing in his epistle, 2 Peter 3.1, he said, this is my second letter, dear friends, and in both of them I tried to stimulate your wholesome, think, wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. <laughs> so Paul now reflects back on what he's already said. Here's four takeaway truths we need to remember as we bring this section to a close. Paul says, the person who puts their faith in Christ becomes altogether new. That's Ephesians 2.15. All believers, Jews and Gentiles, are now one body. That doesn't seem like a big deal to us today. That was a revolutionary thought back in the first century. There was no relationship between Gentiles and Jews, and now because of Christ, the wall of separation has been broken down. Uh, number three, we who were far away from God have brought, been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2.17, and all this is on the screen if you're taking notes. And so we were away from God. Now because the blood of Jesus was shed, we can approach God at any time. It's not based on my worthiness or my merit. It's because he shed his blood for me. Fourth and lastly, all believers are equal citizens of God's kingdom and family. We're all in the family. We're all equal one is not better than another. Okay, so now Paul is writing these words as a prisoner, but he sees God's bigger picture. Look at verse one and two. I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Because of my preaching to you Gentiles, as you already know, God has given me the special ministry of announcing his favor to you Gentiles. Paul wrote this from a prison. Most commentators believe it was when he was incarcerated in Rome. But it's interesting that Paul does not describe himself as a prisoner of Rome, but rather a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And that's because Paul recognized, though he probably did not want to be imprisoned in Rome, that he was placed there by God. Either God did it or God allowed it. <laughs> it was Paul that wrote Romans 8.28, after all, we know that all things are working together for good to those that love God. So he says, I'm here because God wants me here. You know, sometimes we're in a place we don't wanna be and we get mad. And I'm in this hospital bed because I had this accident or I'm facing this conflict because of this person. Did you ever stop and think God allowed it for a purpose? Well, you better start thinking about it because he did, if you're his child. And then he says something very similar in verse 13. He says, don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, and you should feel honored. So Paul's saying he was a prisoner because of his preaching, and he was suffering for them. Let me say a few words to you that feel called to be a leader someday in the church. Maybe some of you would love to become a pastor someday or uh, have some role of leadership somewhere, somehow, maybe a missionary or maybe just serving as a Sunday school teacher in some other capacity. But you would like to be a spiritual leader. You would like to be a person that influences others. And by the way, that's a, a great thing to long for. I want you to know that there's a cost to being a leader. Uh, in fact, leaders sometimes suffer for others. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.1, when we're weighed down with troubles, it's for your benefit and salvation. When God comforts us, it's so we in turn can be an encouragement to you. <laughs> Why does a leader suffer? Sometimes so they can offer help to others who are suffering. You know, when our son went to be with the Lord, it's almost been seven years now, I had people come up to me and say, why did God allow this to happen to you? And I think the implication was, I don't know what, that preachers get a free pass on pain, that we don't have to go through the same trials and hardships as any other human being on earth. Well, it's, it's not true. I mean, leaders suffer in every way as every person suffers, but the difference might be that now we have a platform that we can use to help other people. 
You know, my friend David Jeremiah and also James McDonald and Alistair Begg all had cancer. And they're all cancer survivors, thank God. And I know that impacted their lives quite dramatically in their preaching and wanting to bring hope and comfort to others who may be battling cancer right now. And I have a ministry uh, to parents who've lost children. In this last week I've talked to two uh, families, one a father and then the other a couple, both lost their only son. So tragic. Their only child and their only son. <clears throat> this is not a ministry I signed up for. Uh, there was a time prior to this, in all honesty, when I saw something like this, I, would, I didn't want to walk into it if I didn't have to. And now I just realize that when I hear these stories, I just volunteer, you know, I'll talk to them. Because I know that I can to some degree relate to them. And I know that I can also share the comfort that I've been comforted with. That's what Paul is saying. We went through these things so we can comfort you with the comfort that we have received from God. So here's the bottom line. I'm not saying I or you go through bad things just so we can help others. But what I am saying is we do go through bad things, period. So, comma, let's help others. I wish we didn't go through bad things. I wish we didn't have to face these challenges and hardships. God allowed it for his purposes. One day we'll know why. But in the interim, let's not waste our pain. And let's not indulge in a pity party. And instead, let's leverage it for God's glory to use as a tool to help other people. And so you say, I want to be used by God. <laughs> Good. That's a God-given desire. But why do we say that? because we wanna be in front of a large group of people with everyone listening to us, or because when we walk by, we want people to say, oh, they're so spiritual. That's a man of God. It's a woman of God. I hope that's not why you do it, because here's the thing you need to consider. A leader is gonna be held accountable for what they do and for what they say. You know, a lot of people wanna be a Bible teacher. That's a good thing to want, but we're reminded over in the book of James, don't want to become teachers, brothers, for you know, we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. <laughs> I know that I'm gonna be held accountable one day for everything that I've said. And that's an awesome responsibility. And honestly, it's also a little bit scary because I'm thinking, okay, God's gonna hold me accountable. And, and you know, it probably doesn't show in my preaching or in my content, but I spent hours preparing my messages. You probably just thought I stood up here and just started talking. But I prepare a lot. I measure my words. Believe it or not, I write my sermons out word for word. And I spend even more time preparing crusade sermons. You see, those are like the most simplistic messages I've ever heard. Do you know it's harder to write a simple message than it is to deliver a complex one? It's actually not hard to give a complex message, confuse people, and talk over their heads. Anyone can do that. You have to work at it to make it understandable and to bring it down to a level where people understand it. And people have said to me, well, it must be so awesome to stand up there at the stage at the Angel Stadium or some other stadium and have all those people looking at you. That must be the most euphoric moment of your life. It's actually, I wouldn't say the opposite, but it's not anywhere close to euphoric. Because I walk up there and I feel like pressure on me, like, man, I better not mess this up. <laughs> Because I know there are people who've brought a loved one they've been praying for and to hear the gospel, and this might be the one shot they're gonna hear it. I know there are people there that, you know, they'll hear it and they may die in the next week because I've heard these stories. I, I know that souls are in the balance and I walk up there and I, have, I feel this weight of responsibility on me and I wanna do a good job. So it's not like I'm enjoying it. Honestly, as I speak to you and I can see your friendly faces, I enjoy doing this. This is fun for me. In a stadium, it's like preaching to a wall. You can't see anybody, you can't hear anyone. You tell a joke, it's just silence. They may be laughing, you'll never hear it. <laughs> so I just focus on what I'm doing and try to do the best job that I can do. But, you know, being a leader is challenging. Leaders are second-guessed, they're gossiped about, sometimes they're slandered. Leaders have their lives threatened all the time. 
I'm no exception to that. They face challenges. I'm not saying this to elicit sympathy because it is a great privilege to lead. I thank God he called me to this. But at the same time, there is a responsibility attached to it. Uh, one person said, the leader needs the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the height of a rhinoceros. It's not easy, but if you're called to do it, you gotta do it, man. And then when you do it, it's one of the most wonderful things ever to be used by God. It, it's such a privilege, it's such a joy. And, and I have found that the ones that God seems to go out of his way to call are the ones that don't wanna do it. They don't wanna do it. It's not the guy that says, Lord, use me, I'm so handsome and, and eloquent and best of all, humble. God says, no, that's okay. I'm gonna go use this guy over here who thinks he's a loser, who never amounted to much in his life, who doesn't think he could ever do anything for me because you know what, I like to work with people like this. That way I get the glory. I mean, look at the pattern in scripture. God calls Moses. And Moses immediately starts with the excuses. Lord, I, I have a, a sp 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 speech impediment. I can't speak well. Get somebody else to do it. Gideon says, Lord, I'm the least of my father's house. You don't want me. Jeremiah says, Lord, I'm too young. I mean, think of some of the people God used. Man, you have some messed up people. Noah got drunk. Jacob was a liar. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal and Jonah ran from God. Job went bankrupt. John the apostle ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying and the Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. So what's your excuse? <laughs> you don't think God could use you? So now we shift gears to a really interesting little portion here of Ephesians 3. Did you know that angels are watching you right now? People ask, do we have guardian angels? I don't know, probably. We have angels around us. <laughs> the Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him. But do we have personal angels that are assigned to us? Maybe we do, but... Here's something that you may not know. Not only are angels watching over you, but angels are learning from you. Well, how's that possible? These are magnificent spirit beings that have seen so many things I've never seen uh, in the presence of God. I know, but actually, angels learn from us. Look at verse 15, or verse 10, excuse me. To the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church Underline that phrase, by the church, to who? The principalities and powers in the heavenly places. God's gonna show his wisdom by the church or through the church to who? The principalities and powers, that is referring to angelic beings. According to the Greek scholar Weist, the word bias from a Greek proposition which speaks of immediate agency. In other words, it's by the church these truths are known. I mean, the angels have seen some amazing things. They've contemplated the glory of God for all of these years. Uh, but they learned something from the church that only we can teach them. Uh, because in the church, they saw what God did for us to reach us. They saw the incarnation of our Lord when he came to this earth as a helpless little baby born in the manger in Bethlehem. They saw the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary for humanity. And they see what happens when God transforms a human life and the difference it makes. And it blows their minds. In fact, we're told over in First Peter, God's plan of redemption was so wonderful, the angels watched it. Or as another translation puts it, it's so wonderful, even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Another way to translate it is the angels are bending low and looking into this. It's like the angels are going, look at this, look at this. Look at these people. Look at what God is doing with these people. This is amazing. Yeah, angels are watching and they're learning from us. So Paul's dealt at great length with our privileges we have in Christ, our spiritual riches. Now we praise a prayer for the power we need to put them into use. Go down to Ephesians 3. Uh, verse 14, Paul writes these words. For this reason, and back in the New King James Version now, 
I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to his riches in glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of God which passes knowledge that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Now as benediction, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to his power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, amen. So this is the second of two prayers recorded in Ephesians. The first is in Ephesians 1, 18 to 19, and in that prayer, the emphasis is on enlightenment. Paul prays in that first prayer, in Ephesians 1, 18, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light and you can understand the confident hope he's given to those he called and that you will understand the greatness of God's power. A prayer for an enlightenment. Hey, I just pray God opens your mind and your heart to all he's done for you. But now in this prayer, the emphasis is on empowerment. It's like, hey, I want you to know how much is there. Now I want you to unleash it. How to make a withdrawal from your spiritual bank account instead of going through withdrawals. How to get your hands in your spiritual well. So it's sort of like the first prayer is, I pray that you'll go down and check your balance. You go down with your ATM card. You know, you're waiting in line. You ever been waiting in line to take some cash out or check your balance and you know, you're, there's a person in front of you and, and their turn comes and they're, they're searching for the card. It's like, couldn't you have pulled it out? We've been standing here five minutes and I'm not gonna say if it's a guy or a girl, but they're going through the purse and they're... <laughs> Some guys carry purses though. Man bag kind of deal. Maybe you could call it a purse. I don't know. But um, so they punch in their code, they get their money, you go up there and Imagine how mind-blowing it would be if you thought your balance was zero and then to check out your balance and it's $10 million. So Paul's praying, I pray that you'll just see what God's put in your account. Now Paul's saying, I pray that you go make a withdrawal. Go ahead, take some of that out of there. So we're talking about our spiritual account, how to get these principles working in our lives. And Paul talks about the width and the depth and the height of God's love. Now this is not saying there's four kinds of love. He's just saying, hey, no matter where you look, it's God's love. You look up, it's God's love. You look down, you look to the right, you look to the left, God's love is there as far as you can see. If you wanna see the length of God's love, you'll find it in how he chose us before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1, four to five. Then we can see the breadth of God's love in that he chose Gentiles and Jews and brought us all into the family of God, Ephesians 2, 11 to 18. Then we can see the height of God's love and blessing us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. And finally, we see the depth of God's love in reaching down to us in our sinful state, uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. But now Paul prays this interesting thing, that Christ would dwell in your heart. My prayer for you is that Christ would dwell in your hearts. Wait a second. Who's he talking to here? Is he pray, talking to non-believers? No, these are the believers in Ephesus. We've already discovered that they've been called, redeemed, adopted, justified, and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Why would you ask for Christ to dwell in a heart like that? Did they suddenly or somehow lose their salvation uh, between chapters two and three? No. You know, sometimes people think they have lost their salvation. Maybe they had one bad thought or they lost their temper, lost my salvation. I know to, I need to go get born again, again. So they come forward at an invitation, they pray a prayer, and then something else happens the next week, I need to get born again, 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 and on it goes. Listen, you only need to be born again once. You don't have to be born again and again and again. When Christ comes into your heart and life, he comes in to stay, and he doesn't leave and return periodically. He stays there. That's good news, right? <laughs> Ephesians 4.30 says that we're sealed for the day of redemption. And I love this promise from Jesus in John 10.28. He says, 
I give them eternal life. They'll never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So both Jesus and the Father have us firmly gripped in their hand. And you're worried about what? What if the devil grabs me? Not when the Father's holding your hand. Not when the Son of God is holding your hand. No one is gonna snatch you out of their protective care. But coming back to this statement, what does Paul mean when he says that Christ may dwell in you? Well, we have to go back to the original language for the answer, and it's fascinating. Because the word that he uses here for dwell, that Christ may dwell in you, is a compound word which basically means to live in a house. But when a prefix meaning down is added, the word comes to mean to settle down, to be at home in a house. So he's not just saying my prayer is that Christ would come and live in your house, so to speak, or live in your heart. I'm praying that he'll come and settle down and be comfortable in your heart and life. That's why the title of my message is, is Christ at home in your heart. It's not that we just give Jesus a place. Lord, here's your little spot, this, this, this little closet that's yours. You can live there and come out on Sundays and we'll talk a little, put you back in the closet. The rest of this house is mine. You're our honored guest, Lord, we honor you. He doesn't wanna be your honored guest. He wants to be a permanent resident. Newsflash, he wants the title deed. Newsflash, he wants the master key. He is master, he is Lord, he's the boss man, not the honored guest. So that's what Paul is saying. My prayer, it's that you will get this, that Christ will settle down and finally be at home in your heart. Do you think that is a description of your heart right now? There's a fascinating contrast back in the book of Genesis between two biblical characters that happened to be related. They were Abraham and Lot. Abraham, of course, we all know as the great patriarch of the Jewish people, and then Lot was the Abraham of nephew. Uh, the, uh, the Abraham of nephew. <laughs> Let's turn that around. Isn't that called juxtaposing something? The nephew of Abraham, or the Abraham of nephew. Uh, so you could say on one hand, Abraham walked with God, and then you could say Lot walked with Abraham. You know, there's people that are very godly. They have their own relationship with the Lord, and there's other people that will hang around people like that for a time, and when they're around the godly man or woman, they'll be doing pretty well, but the moment they're away from the godly influence, they're drugged down immediately. They're not that godly influence somewhere else. They're the one that is influenced. Which one of those people are you? Are, are, are you an influencer, or are you one that is weak and is easily influenced by others? Well, Abraham walked with God, Lot's wife, uh, Lot's wife, see, well he had a wife, but that's not what I was gonna say. Lot's life, we'll get to her, his wife in a moment. Um, <laughs> Lot's life was not of that caliber. So, in Genesis 18 and 19, we have a fascinating contrast, and I'm gonna give you a homework assignment after this message is over. Just go back in your own time and read Genesis 18 and then read Genesis 19. We have this fascinating contrast between Lot and Abraham. You say, but what does that have to do with our topic? I thought you were talking about Christ being at home in your heart. I am. So one day, three angels came to visit Abraham. Many Bible commentators believe one of those angels was Christ himself. It may have been a Christophany an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. They come to Abraham, the man of God, who is in the middle of God's will, doing God's work in God's way. He lived in a place called Mamre, which means fatness or well-fed. <laughs> so Abraham, he was spiritually fat and sassy. <laughs> He's doing well. He's close to God. So along come these three heavenly messengers, possibly three angels, possibly two angels, and the Lord himself, and, uh, and they spent time with him. In contrast to Abraham, Lot was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a city that was known for excessive wickedness and depravity. Lot was in an ungodly place with ungodly people tolerating ungodly things. So Christ 
comes to both of them in effect, or at least the angels do. Let me ask you a question. Where would you like to be when Christ returns? Worshiping the Lord in church? Or having a beer with the boys at the local bar? Now where would you like to be? Number two, they were in different positions when God came to them. Genesis 18, one says, Abraham was sitting at the entrance of his tent. Well, in contrast, Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. You see, Abraham lived in tents because we're told over in Hebrews 11:10 he looked for a city with foundations whose builder and maker was God. So Abraham knew, hey, you know what? My ultimate home is heaven. And so until that day, I'll live in a tent. And in the same way, we're in a tent. The Bible, on more than one occasion, calls our body a tent. Did you know that? So, hey, tents aren't meant to last forever. You know, you can stretch them all you want, and you can do whatever you want to your tent, to, but yet it's gonna wear out eventually. And so we were, are reminded of this in Scripture. This body is temporary, but one day we'll receive that glorified, radically upgraded version of our body. One day we'll be in a sinless state. One day we'll be in heaven. So we know as we walk through life on this earth that we are sojourners, we're pilgrims, we're visitors. Our eternal home is in heaven. That doesn't mean we're disconnected and weird because I think Christians can enjoy life more than anyone because we know the God who made it. But at the same time, we know that one day we'll leave this world. That was Abraham, he knew that. And you know, I find that those that think the most about the next life or the afterlife have the best version of this life. C.S. Lewis said it best, and I quote, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in, aim at earth and you will get neither. Does that make sense? You know, if you aim at earth and everything's about earth, everything's about your possessions, everything's about this life now, you won't get earth and you won't get heaven. But if you aim at heaven and you seek heavenly things and you seek to honor God, earth gets thrown in. You have a great life here in this earth, but then one day even a greater life in heaven. So Abraham understood that, but Lot didn't. Abraham was hanging out at his tent. Lot was in the gateway of the city. What does that mean? Well, back in ancient times, if you sat in the gateway or the entrance to the city, that meant you were a leader there. Lot was sort of like a, an elected official. Maybe you could call him the, the mayor of Sodom or the governor of Gomorrah. But he was a leader. Uh, number three, they reacted differently when the Lord came to them. When Abraham saw his heavenly visitors, Genesis 18, two says, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them. While Lot, in Genesis 19, one, just got up to meet them. <laughs> It's sort of like, you know, when you're a little kid and you're in trouble and your mom said, just wait till your father gets home and who you're freaking out because you're, you haven't been a good boy or a good girl. But if you were doing well that day and mom says, daddy, you'll be home in five minutes. You're all excited. You're gonna run to throw your arms around your father. Same thing can happen in our relationship with God. You know, when we're close to God and we hear Jesus is coming back, our heart leaps a little, yes. I want that. And when you're not walking with the Lord as you ought to, when you hear that Christ could come back at any moment, it, it, your heart sinks a little because you're not living as you should. Maybe it could be demonstrated in the way we go to church. Some are anxious, can't wait to get there. I'm going to church. They're there early even because they don't want to miss the worship and they want to hear the message and they want to stay afterwards for the fellowship. Some, oh, church again, didn't we do that last week? and they're late to the service, and they miss most of the worship, and then they leave early, and you know, it's really why. You know, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. He didn't say I was mad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord, or I was sad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. Were you glad when you were on your way to church? Hey, come on, you guys are here in a midweek Bible study. Give yourself a round of applause, really. Don't you think it's kind of prideful to be applauding yourself though, seriously? No, sorry, but, but really, I mean, my hat's off to you. I mean, being in church on Sunday is one thing, but coming to a midweek study, you guys have jobs, you have responsibilities, you have things you have to do. You said, I'm taking time to worship God. That is really admirable, and I pray that God will bless you for it. 
That was Abraham. He wanted to get as close as he could. Lot, he kinda still wanted to hang out with ungodly people. And the Lord reacted very differently to each of them as a result. When the Lord showed up with the angels at Abraham's tent, and Abraham said, hey, we wanna have a meal for you guys. They're like, great, love to. So he runs back to Sarah, Sarah, <laughs> kill the fatted calf and make some good food. And so they whip up this feast and they had a nice long time of fellowship. When the angels went to Sodom, Lot said, why don't you come into my house and have a meal with me? And they said, we'd rather stand in the street. Wow, talk about being blown off. Can you imagine? Would you like to come in and have dinner? No, I'd rather stand in the street. That's exactly what they said. And then finally, Lot convinced them to come inside. And when they're having the meal together, the citizens of Sodom come banging on the door because they saw these strange visitors and they said, send these men out to us that we may know them. That's King James, but I'll tell you what it really meant in the original language. Send these men out to us that we may have sex with them. That's how twisted this culture was. And so Lot, showing how compromised he was, goes to these people and he says, brothers, don't act so wickedly. These men have come. I'm showing hospitality to them. Here, take my two virgin daughters instead. How would you like to have been one of Lot's daughters? Dad, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm trying to imitate a teenager, not very well, but what kind of a father offers his virgin daughters? And this guy, man, he was upside down. <laughs> In fact, if you only read the Genesis account about Lot, I don't even know if you'd think he was a Christian or a believer, I should say, in Old Testament context, but he was. Because in the New Testament, he's referred to as righteous Lot, which just goes to show you can be a believer who's living in a compromised situation. So for the man that was walking with God, the Lord wants to hang out with him. For the man that isn't walking with God, the Lord's not comfortable there. In fact, the angel said, we gotta get you out of here. And they had to yank him out of Sodom. He didn't wanna go. It's like pulling a kid out of a toy store. He didn't wanna leave. And then his wife, she didn't want to go either. And, and the angel said, just come on. This city is going to be destroyed. Don't look back. Of course, she did look back, didn't she? And she became a pillar of salt, the Bible said. That's why Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. So I bring this up because is Christ at home in your life? Would he come to you and would he be comfortable? Would he settle down there? Or, or would he be ill at ease, sort of, you know, by things you do and, and decisions you make? And when we talk about the heart, we're talking about our life, our mind, our, our personality. There's a great little book out, I think it's still in print, it's called My Heart, Christ's Home by Robert Boyd Munger. And he sort of uh, paints a little picture in his book of, of our heart being like our home and what would happen if Jesus were to show up at our house. So think about this for a moment. Like you go home after church tonight and there's a knock at the door and it's kinda late, who's knocking at our door? Uh, hello, who is it? It's Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. If you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I've heard that somewhere. And you open the door and there stands before you Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Wow. Okay, Lord, come on in. So Munger sort of takes this idea of Jesus walking through his house. And I quote from his book, he entered with me and looked around at the book's in my bookcase, my magazines on the table, the pictures on the walls. As I followed his gaze, I became uncomfortable. Strangely enough, I never felt bad about this room before, but now that he was there with me, looking at these things, I was embarrassed. There were some books on the shelves. His eyes were pure, too pure to look at. On the table were a few magazines that Christian has no business reading. And as for the pictures on the walls, the imaginations and thoughts of my mind, some of these were shameful, end quote. So let's say Jesus is walking through your house. He's, he's kind of checking out your library. You're looking at it with new eyes. Like, oh, okay. And then he's uh, going through your video collection, checking out your DVDs. Ooh, now he's over on your computer and he's looking at your history. 
He's looking at websites that you visited. Now he's got your stinking phone. And he's checking your emails and your texts. He's just checking out everything. You're really uncomfortable, why? Maybe there are some things you should not be doing. Well, here's the thing you need to know. Jesus does see all of these things. And I wonder if you or I are doing something that would cause him to not be at home in our heart. And if we are, we need to make a change. Maybe there's some skeletons in our closet that he needs to deal with. This is a time to surrender every nook and cranny over to Christ. I don't even know what a nook and cranny are, but I think you should surrender everything, including those. And he will clean your house. Know that. Here's a show on TV on the Food Channel. Any of you watch the Food Channel? I like the Food Channel. It's not good to watch at night, though which is when we usually watch it and I get hungry. <laughs> but there's a show on the Food Channel that's called Restaurant Impossible. Have you ever seen that show? And uh, it's, uh, the host of the show is Robert Irvine. And he uh, is contacted by people who own restaurants that are failing for some reason. Uh, their business is down and so forth. So he shows up and he checks out the restaurant and orders some food off their menu and, and, and he'll you know, look at their facilities and look at how the staff interacts and, and then he'll come and say, okay, here's what you need to do. And he'll get the owners, operators in there and he'll talk to each staff member and sometimes he'll have to actually show them how to cook food properly and use fresh ingredients. And, but then he has a team of people that come in and will refurbish a restaurant and what seems to be a pretty short amount of time, they'll come in, they'll tear everything apart, and they'll put new furniture in and new appliances in and, and totally transform the place and then have a grand opening. And then the owner, uh, they don't get to see what he's doing until it's all done, and then the show usually ends with a long line outside of the restaurant, and the owner walks in and sees it for the first time. It's pretty cool, actually. So that's what Jesus wants to do in your heart. He comes walking, he goes, okay, we're gonna make some changes here. This is coming out, that's gotta go. You have to change this area, and I'm gonna put this, oh man, this is a drag. I asked Christ to come into my life. He's messing everything up. It's like a construction site. It's a hard hat area. This is no fun. Hey, just wait till he's done. Because what you're gonna discover is whatever he removes from your life will be replaced by something far better. That's what we need to remember. And there may be things he wants to change. There may be relationships you are in right now that are dragging you down spiritually. Even worse, you might be dragging someone else down spiritually. Are you a stepping stone or a stumbling block to other Christians? There might be things you're looking at, things you're listening to, things you're exposing yourself to that are detrimental to your spiritual life. You're sort of like Lot, living in two worlds, too much of the world to be happy in the Lord, too much of the Lord to be happy in the world. That's a stupid way to live your life. You wanna be like Abraham where the Lord is comfortable <laughs> hanging out with you and likes being with you and you like being with him. Is Christ at home in your heart? I didn't ask you if Christ lives in your heart. I asked you, has he settled down and is he comfortable and is he at home there? Because Paul says, that's my prayer for you, that Christ would finally settle down and be at home in your heart. Hey, I can't think of a better time to resolve this than at the communion table. Because uh, you say, well, there's no table there, Greg. Well, it's, it's a table that only men and women of God can see. Do you see it? No, it's not. The table's in the back, I'm just kidding. Um, but we're going to take the elements from the table. Of course, the broken, unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, the cup that symbolize the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Why do we receive communion? Because Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. And you remember he met with his disciples in the upper room and he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you, take and eat. This cup is a symbol of my blood that will be shed, drink of this. So we do this to remember. You know, people go to bars and they drink to forget. Non-believers drink to forget. Christians drink to remember. To remember what God did for us and the great sacrifice he made as Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us. 
2,000 years ago. But then the Bible says when we come to this communion table, we should examine ourselves. What does that mean? It means we should ask ourselves the question, am I right with God? Because Paul tells us, if a man or a woman eats or drinks of these elements in an ungodly manner, they eat and drink judgment to themselves. What does that mean? That means if I receive this element of the bread and the cup and I'm not walking closely with God or I am not even a believer, this isn't gonna help me spiritually. This is actually gonna hurt me spiritually because in a way, it's sort of like you're making fun of a holy thing. And we don't believe the bread that we're gonna hold turns into the body of Jesus. We don't believe that the cup turns into literal blood, transubstantiation, but we do believe they represent one who is holy. So to sum it up, communion, the Lord's table, it's for Christians only. I didn't say perfect Christians. Otherwise, none of us could receive these elements. But it's for believers, and maybe as you come to this table, you would say, you know what, I've been compromising. I'm like Lot the sequel. And I've been doing things I know I should not be doing. Hey, this would be the perfect time to repent. And repent means to stop it and change your direction. Someone else might say, well, you know, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. You said the beginning of your message that Christ can come and live in my heart. I don't know if Christ is in my heart or not. Well, why don't we get that resolved right now? Let's go back to that verse we quoted earlier. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Jesus Christ wants to come into your life and forgive you of your sin. Would you like him to come in? Well, you just have to open the door and say, Well, come on in, Lord. Have you done that yet? You say, Well, how do you do such a thing? You do it through prayer by saying, Lord, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. And in a moment, we're gonna close in prayer, and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to ask Christ to come into your life to be your Savior and Lord. If you've not done this, respond to this invitation. And if you've already made a commitment to Christ, but maybe you've fallen away, hey, you don't need to be born again, again, but you could make a recommitment. Recommitments are a good thing to make. And if you need to do that, we'll give you that opportunity as well. So let's, I'll bow our heads right now. Everybody praying, please. Father, we thank you for your word to us. Now let us respond in the right way. First, I pray for any here that do not yet know you. Help them to see their need for you. Help them to come to you and believe in Jesus right now. We pray that your Holy Spirit will convict and convince of sin. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, how many of you would say tonight, Greg, pray for me. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven. I want my sins forgiven. I want a second chance in life. Pray for me. I want Jesus right now. If that's your desire, wherever you're sitting, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, will you lift your hand up? Lift your hand up where I can see it. I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high where I can see it, please. God bless you and you and you. Anybody else? There in the back, God bless. In the very back there, God bless you. Anybody else? You want your sin forgiven. You want Christ to live in you. He's ready. He's waiting. You just have to open the door of your life. God bless you. One final moment. If you haven't lifted your hand yet, lift it now. Let me pray for you. Raise your hand if you want Christ in your life. God bless you. Now while our heads are still bowed, maybe some of you would say, well, I do need to make a recommitment. I've been doing things no Christian should ever do. And I don't want to come to this table living this compromised life, and I want to recommit my life to Christ right now. If that's your desire, I want you to raise your hand. You need to make that recommitment to him tonight. Raise your hand up. I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless you. All right, now I'm going to ask that everyone that has raised their hand, if you would, please, I want you to stand to your feet, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Stand up. If you raise your hand, saying you want Christ in your life, saying you want to come back to the Lord, recommit your life, stand to your feet, and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Just stand up. That's right, you heard me right. Stand up. Others are standing. You won't be the only one. Stand up. Stand up right where you are. You're among family and friends here. Don't be embarrassed. We love you. And we've all made the same commitment. Anybody else? You need to make this commitment to Jesus or a recommitment. Stand to your feet in this closing moment. We're gonna pray together. 
even if you did not raise your hand, stand up now if you want to make this commitment to Christ. You want Jesus in you. One final moment. Stand to your feet now. Anybody else? All right. Anybody else stand? God bless you guys. You that are standing, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, as I pray, pray this prayer out loud right where you stand. Okay? Pray this after me now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I know you are a Savior. And I know you love me. And I ask you to come into my life right now. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my friend. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this moment forward. Thank you for calling me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless all of you. Let's welcome them. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all of you. Praise the Lord. Many of you stood and prayed that prayer. We want to welcome you into God's family and we're going to receive communion together. And by the way, welcome to your first communion service as a Christian. We're so glad that we could be a part of that. So welcome. And when we're done with communion, uh, we're going to give you a Bible that looks like the one I'm holding here. This is the New Testament. It's called the Start Bible. And we want to talk with you for a few moments about what it means to follow Jesus. Over to my left, your right, here's one of our counselors holding the Start Bible. We're going to direct you over to this area. There's a room back there. We're going to direct you to that room at the end and we'll talk with you for just a few moments, okay? So we'll remind you about that in a moment. But we are going to continue our worship and distribute these elements of communion. We would ask that you wait until everyone is served. And then when everyone is served, we'll partake together, okay? So let's pray together. All right, let's, well, let's pray and then worship the Lord. Lord, bless this time now as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. You told us to remember, and it's something that we need to do because so often we forget all that you've done for us. Lord, we're so thankful. We're so appreciative. So bless this time of worship now we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.